And um, I wanted to kick off tonight with the theme of curiosity by looking at curiosities here in this, in this cabinet. And I'm going to start, um, because we, we, I mean, sooner or later we'll get to the vegetable lamb of tartary because that's pretty awesome. But uh, tonight I want to talk a little bit more about that wee beastie up in the middle left. So he is so cute. He's so cute. Um, and he, I want, to, I want to open this evening with talk about tiny dragons and Socratic paradoxes and talk just a little bit of shit about Leonardo da Vinci's work habits. Um, <laughs> so to do that, we're going to start with this guy. We're going to start in Italy at the tail end of the 16th century, just as the fervor for cabinets of curiosities was really kicking into gear. And as that post-Renaissance scientific revolution started to make way to pave the way towards the Enlightenment. With this guy, this guy on the 13th of March, 1572, Gregory XIII was named Pope after just one day of deliberation amongst the cardinals in Rome. He was a pretty popular guy. On that same day, in the countryside near his home in Bologna, a fearsome beast was spotted, tracked and killed by a local farmer. It was a ferocious dragon of lore and legend, and it appeared just as it did on the family crest of the new pope, formerly known as Ugo Boncompagni, family motto, dragon rising. The appearance of the dragon was taken as a sign by pretty much everyone. It was either an omen or a portent of the greatness of this new incoming pope, a, a marker of his rise to power and the significance of the family name, or possibly by rivals and uh, political opponents, a very, very bad omen, a sign of the end times, a demonic intervention in the mortal plane. <laughs> The corpse of the monster was taken to a local expert, the well-known naturalist at the University of Bologna, renowned for his wide-ranging curiosity, his knowledge of exotic plants and animals, and enthusiasm for collecting curiosities, Lucy Aldrovandi. He examined the mighty beast and pronounced within just five days his verdict. It was real, it was a dragon, and it was a wonder, not a monster not an omen of the Antichrist, but merely an extraordinary natural creature previously unknown to science. He submitted his findings and this drawing to the Pope's son, Filippo Boncompagni. It is admittedly not the most exciting of dragons. <laughs> It was not, in fact, even the most exciting dragon in the collection of Ulysses Aldrovandi. This one, for example, was a gift and purportedly came from Egypt, where Herodotus had claimed to hear of such mon monsters centuries earlier. And, in fact, dragons and other mythical monsters, dead ones at least, specifically basilisks, were surprisingly common in early cabinets of curiosity in the Renaissance period. Any halfway self-respecting collector had at least one. Because, I mean, your jackalope is cute and all, <laughs> but check out my dragon. <laughs> you can see the appeal. This one here might be the most famous of the preserved dragons. It was a gift to one Cardinal Francesco Barberini from King Louis XIII, illustrated here by Giovanni uh, Faber around 1651. So about three quarters of a century after, after the Pope's dragon made its appearance. It looks a little worse for wear in this illustration, but it gives us an intriguing peek of the anatomy of the monster, which is kind of confusing with a sort of belly slide action going on. Um, this dragon specimen, this one object, was so famous that one of the all-time great seekers of obscure knowledge, the insatiably curious collector Athanasius Kircher, included it in his book, Munda Subterraneus looking slightly more intact, but no less fearsome with its snapping jaws. And then finally here, I love this one. This is the adorable dragon owned by Cornelius Meyer, sporting a friendlier and vaguely more anatomically reasonable hind-legged anatomy and a somewhat more playful dis disposition. So the point here is the Pope's dragon was important. It was special, but it wasn't technically speaking unheard of. It was a thing that people, or at least people in certain circles, had seen before. Nonetheless, the Pope's not very exciting dragon excited a lot of popular curiosity, and Aldrovandi found himself inundated by correspondents wanting to know everything there was to know about dragons. 
Aldrovandi, not one to miss an opportunity, rushed into production a treatise on dragons shrewdly dedicated to the Bon Compagni family. Demand rapidly outstripped supply because as more people learned of the existence of the dragon, the more questions they had. For example, how is it captured? If dragons are so ferocious, how is it possible that there are so many of them dead and kicking around in Europe in rich people's extra closets? <laughs> if it's a natural creature, why haven't we seen it until recently? Are they invading? Have they been hiding? Or if it's not real, if it's a fake, what's it made of? Who made this wonderful thing? Can I make one? <laughs> and then philosophically, if dragons are real, and this object is real, what exactly is fake? How is this different in terms of proof than an illustration of a dragon? So, exa for example, if I made a platypus by sewing together a duck and a beaver, <laughs> does that make a platypus not real? <laughs> Which turns out is, comes to what we know about curiosity. This is not the great and all-powerful Oz, this is Plato. <laughs> um, who spent a lot of time talking about, in his uh, Socratic dialogues, about what it is to be curious. And in those dialogues, a character by the name of Mino posits the question, how can you possibly know what you don't know? It's become known as Mino's paradox. And of course we can't. We are blind to these so-called unknown unknowns. But the process of questioning and curiously seeking is the quest not to know everything, which is obviously impossible, but to move as many things as possible into the realm of known unknowns, like the dragon. And it's these known unknowns that drive curiosity. We become curious not about the things we don't know anything about, unknown unknowns, or about the things that we know everything about, known knowns, but the things that we know just enough about to excite a desire to know more until we know enough to move on. These known unknowns are often described in terms of an information gap. The information gap theory suggests that all curiosity comes from a deep-seated desire to quell the awkward feeling of knowing that you don't know. <laughs> The tension is at the heart of a good mystery novel, the structure of a good joke, or why you can't let it go when someone leans in close to you and says, you know what, never mind. <laughs> we want to know. <laughs> the idea assumes that the middle ground between knowing that you don't know is inherently unpleasant rather than pleasurable, but that somewhat fails to account for why we might ever pick up another mystery novel. <laughs> So it turns out it's a balance. It's a tension between pleasure and fear that coexists in that moment, both of which are, which are, both of which are associated with dopamine in the brain. And as long as you know that you don't know, this tension exists. It is Schrodinger's curiosity. <laughs> and I think this is at the heart of what it is to be curious. It's a trained response to the pleasures of obtaining knowledge that drives a willingness to face uncertainty to displace fear in favor of that pleasure, and to seek to know more of what you don't know. To delight in the certainty that there are infinite unknowns, unknowably more vast than what is or could even possibly be known. This curiosity is the fire that burns behind extremely creative people, driving them to explore new ideas, whether it's in the arts or the sciences, or both here. Um, in exploring terra incognita, for example, or spending more time than is strictly reasonable trying to track down whether or not certain desiccated dragon corpses are still exist in private collections. Um, extremely curious people have some things in common, and I think some of these things will sound familiar. I have a sneaking suspicion. Uh, the first is a tendency for widely varied areas of interest. The second is being more than a little bit obsessive about those areas of interest. The third is a seeming opposing tendency to abruptly drop one area of passionate interest in favor of a newly discovered one. <laughs> and fourth, a tendency to take on more projects than one might reasonably be able to complete. <laughs> For all of his passionate curiosity, vast and diverse areas of expertise and tremendous accomplishments, Leonardo da Vinci was known in his time for being something of a slacker. He had a reputation for abandoning half-completed projects. 
In fact, these traits drove Leo X, Pope Leo X, to complain about Leonardo da Vinci's work ethic, saying in apparent frustration, alas, this man will never do anything, for he begins by thinking about the end before the beginning of his work. And I hope that makes you all feel just a little bit better about yourself <laughs> as much as it does me. And then finally, there is one other thing that curious people seem to share, and that is an appreciation of curiosities, as in odd objects and marvels of nature. Studies have repeatedly shown that novel, novel, complex, or incongruent phenomena inspire what's called perceptual curiosity. And that perceptual curiosity is that flicker that transforms an unknown thing into a known unknown. What is that thing? Which brings me back to the desiccated dragons. So a long time has passed since Aldrovandi and Pope Gregory's day. Science, I think it's fair to say, has come quite a long way. Tesla just put a convertible into space, which I don't think was on our list of things <laughs> that we were expecting to happen. <laughs> it is now, apparently. Um, but those, those dragons are still driving curious inquiry 400 years later. Um, here's a paper from 2014 in the journal Paleontologia Electronica by two very patient researchers looking into claims uh, that these dragon specimens were proof of prehistoric flying reptiles flapping around Renaissance Italy. Spoilers. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> But what they did find out through curious inquiry was what they were, which turned out to be no small undertaking. In this case, for example, Cardinal Barberini's dragon was composed of the skull of a least weasel, which is my favorite weasel, <laughs> skins of a snake on the bottom, a wall lizard on the top, also feet, and maybe wings from an Australian frilled lizard. They weren't totally sure because the anatomy didn't work out totally, but it was the closest they could find, and the skeletal tail of a Mediterranean eel. That's some fun taxidermy, people. <laughs> which brings me to this, which is a thing that pretty much no one directly, directs, uh, directly mentions in any of the descriptions of these supposed sightings or any of these specimen descriptions. These ferocious dragons, these fearsome monsters marauding the Bolognese countryside and, and making omens of the apocalypse, they were made with weasel parts. These are lap dragons. <laughs> Tiny, adorable portents of the apocalypse. <laughs> so perhaps it is no great surprise with that in mind that the dragon frenzy of 1572 failed to adversely impact the papacy. <laughs> pope Gregory came out of the whole dragon appearing on your Pope Day thing pretty much fine. No apocalypse happened. And he went on to become a great patron of the arts and the sciences. Uh, he radically redesigned the calendar, which we've talked about here before. He commissioned some really great maps. And he went on to festoon the Vatican with rather a lot of dragons. <laughs> and in the end, Aldrovandi's dragons outlived him. His book of serpents and dragons was finally published in 1640, decades after his death, and is now one of his most famous works, copied ferociously for centuries afterwards. So I'd like to end with the words of another very curious human, one from our age, one who spent a lot of his time poking into the odd corners of the history of science and curious inquiry, and a person with whom I would very much like to have a beer, Bill Bryson from his book, which was tonight's speaker's book, A Short History of Nearly Everything. He wrote, our instinct may be to see the impossibility of tracking everything down as frustrating, dispiriting, perhaps even appalling, but it can just as well be viewed as almost unbearably exciting. We live on a planet that has more or less infinite capacity to surprise. What reasoning person could possibly want it any other way? And so, I'd like to invite you to join me and raise your glass with me, the first glass of this new year, to tiny dragons and patient scientists, the pursuit of known unknowns, and the promise of infinite surprises to curiosity. <laughs>